on 5, 3, 2, 1. Hi, 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 guys. Hi, guys. It's nice to see you again. Um, I'm here with Dr. Jose Gonzalez Rodriguez from the University of Lincoln. Uh, first, I would like to say thank you, Dr. Jose, for uh, accepting our invitation, quickly accept our invitation, by the way, and for being here to be our guest owner in this first uh, event of the uh, post-graduation of our post-graduation program, Chemistry of our University, for Federal University of Paraíba. Uh, we are celebrating the 36th, I believe, anniversary of our program. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> and we are happy to, to have you here for your, I believe, the, the Professor Diana uh, had an, an introduction about yourself. But I have some words in English for the other the, the, the worldwide audience to know a little uh, about you. Okay, so I can uh, tell about, tell a little um, words about you, and after you can start your presentation. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, uh, Professor Dr. Gonzalez Rodriguez holds both degrees in chemistry and biochemistry from University of Cordoba. Cordoba in a master's degree in environmental science from Polytechnic, Polytechnic University of Madrid, uh, PG from University of Cordoba also in analytical chemistry, and has developed research in this area for more than 19 years. And Dr. Gonzalez has published six, seven publications, 40 communications to Congress up to date, and has attracted funds over three 0.5 million pounds, wow, to date over this period. He's currently the program leader of the Masters of in Forensic Science of the University of Lincoln and has also refereed more than 200 papers for international journals and has acted as evaluator and reviewer for different national research international bodies, including the Portuguese Research Agency, the Academy of Finland, the European Commission uh, in programs such as Secure Society's FP7, the Horizon 2020, and the Marie Curie program. Uh, recent public engagement includes two written evidence to the UK Parliament in COVID-19, I believe. Yep. Yep. He's a member of several professional bodies such as the Royal Society of Chemistry, American Society, American Chemical Society, International Society of Electrochemistry and Society for of Forensic Science of the UK. Currently, he's supervisor for, of four PhD students and two master by research. So today, uh, Professor Jose is going to talk about us of experience, experience in forensic analysis, most specifically in explosive and explosive tagants. So Professor Jose, thank you again. And I'm going to show your presentation, and you feel free to talk to us. Thank you. Thank you, Sharlan. OK, well, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the University of Paraíba for inviting me. I mean, uh, Dr. Sherlan for inviting me, and, and you guys, because you're going to actually listen to my blah de blah on my talk. So I hope it's going to be entertaining. and educational and at the end you're going to know a little bit more about the the world of explosives and explosive tagants so i mean when we talk about explosives you know what explosive substance is it's a mixture that undergoes a chemical oxidation and rapidly basically release uh, energy uh, the energy is in the form of heat light sound and a wave pressure well pressure wave sorry yeah so uh, I mean, if we are going through a formal classification of explosives, uh, we can basically classify them in high or low order. And that is basically is defined by whether they actually are going to deflagrate or they are going to detonate. And uh, which, what difference is actually one or the other? Basically, that is determined by the they, whether they break the speed of sound or they don't break the speed of sound, they, they, they basically that pressure wave is, 
is uh, faster than the speed of sound or not. So the uh, important thing when, or the thing that is, is actually mattering the most when you are actually uh, looking at the release of energy is that that release of energy is fast. Uh, I mean, just to give you an example, I mean, you have black powder. I mean, if you if you look at at black powder, that's going to everybody understand that that's basically an explosive. It's going to detonate, uh, and it's going to produce energy. Uh, but actually, if you look at the Snickers, uh, I mean, the the chocolate bar, uh, you basically get uh, the on the screen you have a, a comparison between black powder and the chocolate bar. So if you actually look that 1.5 grams of black powder is going to release uh, 3.2 kilojoules of energy. And you look at that, the chocolate bar is going to release uh, 2,137 kilojoules per 100 grams. I mean, if you do just the, the comparison per gram, uh, you can see actually that if you look at a gram of chocolate and a gram of black powder, the chocolate contains more energy. And then, but nobody actually dies from an explosion from a chocolate bar. So why is that? It's because the energy that you release with chocolate is very slow. You cannot basically make it work fast. However, with black powder, when you have the adequate oxidant, it's going to release that energy very fast. And that is the difference. So it's not the amount of energy you can store in the molecule, it's actually how fast the energy can be released. So actually, uh, not now, but then when you actually look at this, you can go to the, the YouTube. Uh, uh, we produced a, a, a video years ago that where you can actually go through the calculations if you're interested in, in how much energy is released by explosives. So, so basically, coming back to the original, uh, uh, basically, uh, this no discrimination, uh, classification of explosive. We said basically low order explosives are those who actually deflagrate at a rate of 343 meters per second, speed of sound. Uh, and they are the typical ones you may know, basically powders, gunpowder. Uh, you can basically get uh, that, with, with, uh, basically that, that's the organic fuel uh, with uh, sulfur charcoal. And then you add on an inorganic oxidizer, which is basically could be chlorates, perchlorates, nitrates, uh, those sort of molecules that are going to supply with the oxygen needed for the explosion. So, and you had a high order explosive. Uh, and then when you come to these uh, high order explosives, you have two types. Again, you have uh, those that are classified into primary and secondary. And the primary are the ones you have on the screen. You basically, they can be mercury fulminate, lead aside, lead estivnate. They are basically called like a special purpose. Um, they are actually quite sensitive to stimuli, uh, energy, like heat, friction, electricity. They actually blow up quite quickly if you actually add energy. And then you have the secondary explosives. Uh, and those secondary explosives are less sensitive. They are the ones that we know well. I mean, TNT, everybody knows that because it's the typical explosive that actually you, you find in many military applications. And then you have other that they may be less known or well known for the non uh, uh, specialists, basically like HMX, uh, PTN, RDX. I mean, those are high explosives that actually are going to release a lot of energy. But uh, the key thing here is that when you're looking at, at how explosives work, uh, I mean, if you have three possible scenarios with explosives here. You can see that on the screen. Uh, we are going to talk about what we call in ex the explosive world, like the explosive train, where you have uh, an ignition source. That ignition source is going to be heat, pressure, electric current, shock friction. That is the initial energy you're going to give to a primer. And that primer is going to be those uh, primary explosives that we were talking about before. Uh, mercury fulminate, they are going to actually produce a small explosion. Uh, that explosion is going to go sometimes through a detonating cord. 
uh, usually another explosive, high explosive, PETN, and then you have another secondary explosive that is going to produce, it's like the main charge that is going to produce the big bang. Uh, and then, again, you can see uh, on the screen that there are different ways you can actually uh, produce this explosive train. You can have a propellant. Sometimes you can add black powder to actually make it more uh, uh, fast. Well, the reaction is going to go faster. You can ask uh, boosters uh, that is going to actually increase the energy. I mean, the, again, there are different combinations. I don't want to go too heavy on this. But then uh, this is going to be necessary to produce an explosion. I mean, you're going to see that very clearly later when I show you some pictures. So, so an example of a very common uh, uh, explosive uh, that actually is available for uh, mining. Basically, you can find this explosive in quarries and it's actually relatively easy to produce. I mean, uh, some terrorists have been using this one because it's actually quite stable is amphon, ammonium nitrate foil oil. I mean, probably you, you've heard in, in the news that sometimes basically uh, there are big explosions in farms. I mean, um, probably the, the best known explosion down to amphon uh, is actually in Lebanon uh, a couple of years back because it was a massive warehouse full of ammonium nitrate. And actually it overheated and then produced a massive explosion. It's actually, ammonium nitrate contains a lot of energy. Uh, and uh, you only need 95% of ammonium nitrate, 5% foil oil. That's a little bit of organic material you add. And that's going to actually trigger everything. I mean, some people have used this explosive in the in the 20th century. I mean, a little bit basically back in 1995, uh, there was uh, the, a very well-known attack on Oklahoma. Uh, and then 168 people died. And that was basically 2.2 tons of Amphor were used to actually uh, demolish the whole building and then they kill loads of people, as, as we said. So uh, what is the problem with this explosive? You need to have a lot of energy to actually detonate. It's quite stable. Uh, and that's why it's used in mining. So actually in Brazil, I mean, you, you basically you are very well known miners. Uh, and then probably many people, when they actually uh, using explosives in mines, basically they will be using Amphor because, as we said, it's quite stable you will need a detonating core to actually explode it, but it's, it's quite quite easy to manufacture, but also quite easy to actually uh, store safely. So you see, for example, this is an example where you have uh, a, a failed terrorist attack. So someone was actually planting a bomb on the roadside, uh, and then you can see the hole there, and then you can see the cable. So that was detonated remotely with a, a detonator, basically from uh, maybe a hundred meters away or something like that. And then they basically, you can see, it was a butane, uh, a gas cylinder that was emptied, and then they filled it up with uh, that powder that you can see with the black beads. That is actually ampho. Uh, and then they were using detonating cords that you can see on the screen. Uh, so actually, they are military grade ones. Uh, so actually, you need to have access to those in order to actually detonate Amphor. But in this case, they, obviously, the terrorists basically managed to get it. And I mean, the luck escape for the uh, the the uh, people in this road is that actually it failed. So actually, the police uh, and the military could actually recover the whole explosive and analyze it later. So so. Here basically is us. So basically, Dr. Prael is actually a, she was one of my PhD students years ago, and then she's basically a, a forensic specialist in the Thai service in the forensic uh, service in Bangkok. And then you see here basically uh, how we prepare the bomb. So actually, you can see that uh, Dr. Prael basically she is actually filling up the tube, and the tube is basically a pipe. It's basically a pipe you use for, for transporting water. And then we actually transform the pipe into a bomb with a detonating cord. Uh, you basically, we put it on, on, a, on a metal plate to so avoid any, any craters. And then obviously we prepare our scenario so we could actually capture the, the debris. So basically you can see the different barrels, like the blue barrels with the, the uh, little uh, trays, aluminium trays, so we could actually capture any debris coming from the explosion. So please, Sherlin, can you show what we did? 
Stand by for firing. Firing now. Oh. Oh, <laughs> okay, it didn't show well. <laughs> Hello? Okay. So yeah, you didn't see the explosion there. Actually, that was very you 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 basically heard explosion, but you didn't see it. So that's okay. Uh, so uh, sure, we could, uh, can show uh, show it again. Yeah, no. we can try. Yeah, should we try again? Stand by for firing. Firing now. Okay, now wow. you saw the explosion. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. wow. So yeah, that was basically me recording with my mobile phone a hundred meters away in this in this safety perimeter. So yeah, so so uh, yeah, that is that basically brings me to a common homemade explosive for improvised explosive devices, basically IEDs. So. If you look at, uh, unfortunately, the world we live in, uh, I mean, there, is a, uh, there was a document produced by Action on Armed Violence, and that was basically 2017, it's like five years ago. And there were basically around 21 countries suffered act uh, explosive actions. Uh, and then 56% of the dead people basically were caused by impro improvised explosive devices. So actually, uh, and then if you look at the number of dead people uh, because of violent action, basically explosives is half of the dead. So basically, when you talk about people trying to kill other people, uh, explosives come into the action, sadly. So uh, what is what we need to do? I mean, ideally, we need to stop terrorists or, or organized crimes from using explosives. Sometimes that's not possible. And then when... Uh, if we cannot avoid the tragedy, uh, what we can try to do is track the perpetrators, uh, and then if we get evidence, bring them to justice. Uh, and that's the best we can do, really. I mean, uh, and I'll show you some examples later how the British police is actually doing that. So uh, we have two scenarios when we are dealing with explosives. Uh, we have people that actually, you can fabricate explosives, it's not complicated, uh, but yeah, the problem is uh, the homemade explosives uh, and the homemade detonators uh, are very, very unstable. So actually, I mean, you can go on YouTube and you can find recipes, please do not do that. Because uh, there are many people that claim that you can manufacture explosives with uh, household products. Uh, that's true, yeah, you can. Uh, what's the problem? They're impure. And then impurities basically can catalyze reactions. You will see later how I'm going to present some information about how uh, catalysis can actually produce reactions that we are not expecting. So actually, when you have a very impure uh, sample uh, or products, uh, you could actually risk yourself. So don't do it. It's not safe. Leave it to professionals to do. The other thing is you can manufacture the more stable ones, and that's what professionals do uh, in in companies and, and 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 yeah, explosive production companies. Uh, but then the detonation requires a, a more sophisticated detonator. They are military detonator that you only find uh, when you are dealing with again with professionals. So actually, again, that is. A, I mean, unfortunately, they are basically that's why some organized guns tries to steal. Uh, military equipment and uh, military uh, detonators because then they can actually manufacture these and then use it for their own purposes. So uh, what is what uh, we need to actually look at? I mean, we're looking at the explosive. The explosive molecule is very well known. I mean, we're talking about TATP, H this basically is a molecule, but explosive is not just the molecule. The explosive it's a, a very, very sophisticated mixture. It's a complex mixture where you add 
uh, other uh, substances you basically can add. Uh, for example, the example the 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 ethylene glycol you have uh, the ethylene glycol dinitrate the EGDN is actually added to nitroglycerin to reduce the freezing temperature. You have uh, plasticizers to actually uh, make them like the plastic explosive to make it like uh, flexible. Uh, there are many, many different types of additives you add to explosives to actually change the properties of the, the, the explosive. And obviously that is being done after very, very uh, basically strict uh, safety measures and actually after years and years of research. So actually, again, when you add in something to explosive, it needs to be thoroughly checked because you will see later when I'm talking about tagans, how things may be or not may be added. So, so we need to understand the mixture of, of uh, uh, these uh, additives. Why? Because uh, when we understand the mixture, you can see what's in there uh, basically added to make the explosive safer, more uh, efficient. Uh, and uh, what is there that we don't know what is there for. And then you will see later that when you actually look at compounds in, in explosives, sometimes you find substances that you don't know what they are. Sometimes basically people add uh, substances that are actually added to mark the explosive. And that's what we call tagant. The word tagant comes from the English word tag. Basically, it's just the tag you put like the, uh, the little uh, piece of paper with a cord. Uh, that you actually write something, this is whatever, and then you put it, and that is, is funny, that is actually the original one, that's basically, that was actually hanging from the original explosives, and then you will see the, a little bit of history in a minute. Uh, but yes, yeah, some others basically are, yeah, not very well known, but, but then that's, that's, again, those are the, com the companies basically add those uh, stabilizers, they add other substances that sometimes they don't disclose because so, as we said before, the explosives uh, basically are the main instrument for terrorism. I mean, it's not all bad when you talk about explosives. If you look at the way we use explosives, we use explosives to actually mine. We use explosives to actually open ways for our roads. I mean, uh, it's, it's when you're using explosives for the wrong reasons, when you're actually making uh, or, or creating a massive problem, and then you're actually doing something illegal. Uh, and then for that point, that's where you need the use of tagants. Uh, and then that is actually the, the presence of these substances, uh, these additives, that the only mission is identifying the explosive is to protect uh, the public and to protect the governments, to actually to facilitate ident the identification of the explosive. So... And that is actually why uh, these days, basically, uh, there will be tagants in many of the explosives that we are using. Uh, sometimes it's known, sometimes it's not. I mean, obviously, governments and militaries are going to actually hide them and not disclose them for obvious reasons. But yeah, as I said, the word tagant comes from the, the little tag that you would basically hand from the, the, the explosive. And that was basically in 1971 when the U.S., uh, organized crime control unit, uh, they actually require all the commercial and military explosives to be tagged. Uh, and that is what's just a label. I mean, you can imagine when someone basically steals a uh, 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 explosive, you basically detach the label, then bye-bye, you don't have identification. So obviously that was pretty obvious that it wasn't going to be very efficient. So actually, uh, in 1978, uh, there were people basically thinking, what is what we can add to an explosive to identify the explosive before and after the explosion. Uh, and that is basically why they started thinking about it. Uh, and then they actually looked for non-reactive, and that is absolutely key. Whatever you add to the explosive cannot actually make it uh, unsafe. Uh, and then we will see some ex ex uh, some uh, examples later where some of the tagans that are in experimentation, they were basically uh, discarded because they may actually make the explosive more sensitive. So, but yeah, in 1980, 
the Congressional Office of Technology Assessment basically made a report, the targets in explosive, and then there was like a set of uh, criteria that you have to follow in order to actually have a target. Uh, and then they were basically uh, before, basically pre-blast and post-blast. So actually, you can actually look at at both. So actually, when we talk about tagans, we have what we call identification tagans, and they are basically thought to be recovered after the blast. And then you have detection tagans that they are basically uh, uh, basically used uh, basically for recognition pre-blast. So what are the uh, key factors uh, in one or the other. So for example, for the identification, and remember identification imply post-blast after the explosion, uh, they need to basically contain the information of the legal holder. So basically you go after an explosion, you can recover the tag and you can identify the manufacturers. Uh, you basically have to be traceable through commercial channels. Uh, you need to produce with that tag and a serial number and important, must survive the detonation. Otherwise, basically, you have something that's useless. So, and then the other type is basically pre-blast, uh, is detection. Uh, and then you can add additives, you can add substances, but then one of the things is they cannot occur naturally. Uh, all the background levels, uh, and then the background levels of that uh, um, targant, uh, basically, the background levels of the instruments are not interfered with. Uh, so actually, you can uh, identify the target, but then you cannot interfere with the identification of the explosive. Usually, I mean, and that applies for those that actually release in vapor. Uh, basically, that has to be a long-term uh, release, five to 10 years. Why? Because someone could actually still uh, explosive today, but they're not going to use it till uh, basically five, 10 years time. Uh, usually you will find that when there is a war anywhere in the world, uh, there will be an illegal trade of explosives because they basically get lost. Militaries basically don't account for explosives when they are fighting each other. Uh, and then basically people could actually get explosives now that may use in 15 years. So actually target needs to be able to still de detect or identify that explosive. They need to be detectable at PPT level, so basically very, very low concentration. Uh, the vapor should not absorb in luggage items because then it's basically you're going to contaminate uh, those items and then produce false positives. Uh, they need to be thermally and chemically stable. They actually, uh, they need to actually have a very easy way to detect the vapors. Uh, so actually needs to be identifiable by usual traditional methods of analysis. Uh, and then they are not degrading uh, with uh, when packaged, uh, and then they have to be safely manufactured and they can be safely stored. So there are many, many uh, different uh, requirements for both identification and detection tagants. So I'm going to give you some examples of identification tagants. So the typical one is basically 3M, the company 3M, you know them. Uh, they fabricate a micro tagant. It's basically it's layer plastic, uh, and then they have uh, different night, there's uh, different colors uh, and one magnetic layer. So the idea is basically it needs to be recoverable after the explosion. You're not going to be looking for little particles. You get a big magnet and then you recover them. Uh, and then when you recover them, you look at the different bands and it's like a color coding. And then the color coding, the different color codings, you have different combinations and that's going to give you the manufacturer, the batch and the information that they have to store. Uh, usually you add this, uh, between 0 0.025 to 0.1% of the weight of the explosive. Uh, and then because it's plastic, it doesn't get destroyed easily. Uh, and then you can recover them easily. And then because it's plastic, it's, it's inert, it's not going to affect the stability of the explosive. So that's important. Then the other one, the other example of identification target is the Explo Tracer by Axalta. Uh, and then you basically can see that it's uh, actually a combination of a pigment and a metal. Uh, and then that combination of colors and the combination of the, the different pigments and metals provide with the code. So actually you're going to have codes that are based on concentrations and the combination of different pigments and, and metals. Uh, so basically you're going to see that you meet all the, the, the previous requirements I was telling you before. I'm not going to bore you where basically you can read on screen. 
Uh, but yeah, it's actually quite usable. Uh, and then people actually mix it with explosives to actually recover them from blast and identify uh, the explosives. So then uh, you have other types, basically the Westing, Westinghouse uh, ceramic. So these actually are ceramic-like particles, again, very strong particles that are made red of red earths, uh, strontium chlorophosphate, uh, aerobium, uh, and ethium vanadate thulium. So actually, they are not very common elements in nature, and then that is actually why you add them. And the key thing is they are actually fluorescent at different uh, uh, wavelengths. So actually, you choose the wavelengths. You can actually make them fluoresce. You can actually spot in it after an explosion. Then you can actually recover them, and then you can actually... Uh, identify the manufacturer using those. Uh, the one space in the Curie point is actually very interesting ones. It's actually iron oxide. You know iron oxide is magnetic, uh, but then when you blend it with other metal elements, uh, such as strontium and barium, uh, you call a compound basically called ferrites. Uh, and then they, they can actually, you can add a, a, a phosphor, uh, basically a, a phosphorescent material. And actually, these elements or these uh, compounds are very peculiar. Uh, they basically only display ferromagnetism. They become magnetic only at a certain temperature. And the way it works is you basically put them, you recover them from the crime, the crime scene or the, the explosion scene, put them in a, in a chamber, and then you increase the temperature till you actually get uh, that uh, Curie point temperature. And then it's basically, then you can actually see when they become magnetic. Um, so again, there are different types. Um, so detection tagons. Uh, detection tagons basically are uh, mm, substances, as we said, that are usually added to identify the explosive before the explosion. So you will see when that happens. I mean, an example is what I told you before. Uh, if you actually are looking enough to basically get the explosive device intact, so basically, for some reason, the detonator fails, the people basically, they don't connect the, the cables well. For some reason, basically, the explosive doesn't go off. Uh, and then you can actually get the, your hands on the, on the explosive. Uh, so yeah, you can actually uh, identify who is actually manufactured. So there are different types. The most typical ones are the vapors, but then I'm going to go through some uh, that actually are approaches that are not usable. Some of them are usable. So the first one is the radioisotopes. That's the one. I mean, you can imagine that very quickly. I mean, you basically are going to add a radioactive material to your explosive. So actually, you can go with a Geiger counter. You can actually say, OK, well, this is actually explosive. This is an explosive here. What is the problem? The problem is, uh, to, well, we have two main problems. First, you're adding a, a radioactive source to something. And then when you have people working with the, the explosives very frequently, they are going to be uh, exposed to a, a level of radiation. It might be low level, but when you have low level very frequently, that's not ideal. Uh, and the second one is what we talked about, sensitive, basically making the, the explosive sensitive. Why? Because you're going to add a substance that is going to emit radiation. Radiation is energy. Energy could actually uh, act in a way that could activate some of the molecules around the, the isotope and then make it explode by accident. So actually, it's quite likely, but there is a potential hazard by adding radioisotopes. So then the other one uh, is the electromagnetic tagon. That was the third type that I told you. So electromagnetic tagons are very clear. It's basically, they are not going to be actually added to the explosive itself. They are going to be added to the detonator. So they are going to be like a small electronic circuit that is going to be emitting a radio frequency. So actually, that is going to actually identify where the, the, the explosive is. Uh, I mean, the thing is, if the terrorists or the people using it illegally, they are going to know that you are tagging that system somehow, uh, they can actually wrap it in metal foil. They can create a Faraday, uh, Faraday cage. And you know, the Faraday cage basically stops uh, all the radiations uh, from 
going out. I mean, we do it with the mobile phones. Basically, if you put it in a, one of these pouches that actually uh, eliminate the radiations that go in and out of the mobile, basically you uh, be eliminate the communications between the mobile and the rest of the world. So you can do the same. So actually terrorists could actually make uh, the explosive uh, non-permeable to radiate uh, electromagnetic radiation. So actually nobody would be able to identify. So that's one of the flaws. And again, it's uh, and that the other is more economical because uh, obviously adding, uh, you basically produce many uh, detonating cords. Uh, if you have to add uh, a little bit of electronic circuit, that's going to increase the cost. And then people don't want to spend money if they can avoid it. So, so actually the most typical ones that you actually can find uh, is actually the vapor ones. Here, basically you have different examples. And actually this didn't come from the military. This came from the International Civil Aviation Organization because they were like worried that the terrorists could actually plant bombs in planes. They basically decided to actually add it so they could identify luggage with uh, uh, this explosive. So, I mean, you have many that are more usable or less usable. I'm going to concentrate in the one that actually is more typical is DNMB. Uh, and DNMB is actually a 2,3-dimethyl, 2,3-dinitrobutane. And uh, basically what you do is you add it to your explosive and that's going to actually release a little bit of a vapor. Uh, it's going to actually uh, make it more identifiable. Uh, and why DNMB is the most common? Because uh, the one you actually, this is the one you use to C4 explosives. C4 explosives is the most common explosives. The, the one that you see in the movies that where you actually put the explosive charges and, and the military are using it all the time. So actually, the good thing as well is DNMB is chemically inert. It's not going to favor any reaction, uh, any interaction with explosives, not going to detonate it by accident. Uh, and then having a low vapor pressure is still basically higher than the vapor pressure you have from the explosive. So actually you can uh, uh, identify it faster than you would identify the explosive. But the other thing is, is considerably lower toxicity. I mean, it's not free of toxicity because I mean, yeah, not many substances are not absolutely uh, inert, but then this one basically is not too toxic. So yeah. so. I mean, especially when you compare it to nitrotoluene that is actually carcinogenic. So, so, uh, so, yeah, it's 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 actually good as well because the permeability of the molecule through materials is actually quite good. Because again, if you have a targant and the targant you have like the 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 the, the, the uh, bag or where you and then the molecule doesn't go through the material, it's not permeable, then you cannot detect it. Then you're basically defeating the objective. But actually, it's not going to be absorbed by uh, polyester, cotton wool, basically typical uh, clothing that uh, basically uh, suicide bombers could actually uh, utilize. Or when you put it in luggage, uh, it could actually uh, con conceal the, the, the vapor. So, so uh, usually DMNB, if you remember, uh, the other property of antagon is that they need to be able to be detectable by usual, usual or common means. So actually you can see there are many analytical techniques that you can utilize to actually identify uh, DMMB. So fluorescence, GCMS, UVBs, FDIR, I mean, many. So, so actually it's, uh, so, it's actually important that you learn or people learn how to detect DMMB if, uh, fast and, and, and accurately because actually that could prevent uh, many attacks, uh, especially if people are using uh, military type explosives that they have stolen from a military base or, or so. So now basically I'm going to go very quickly through the way we actually uh, do things in the UK. Uh, so basically, I mean, every country has their own uh, military or civil uh, institution that are dealing uh, with the analysis and, and, and basically deter detection of explosives. So in the UK, basically, is the, the Defense Science and Technolo Technology Lab, basically DSTL. They, they have a unit. That unit is a forensic explosive lab. It's basically FEL. Uh, and they are the responsible for the analysis identification of explosive material. And 
the FEL has been in, in existence uh, since 1870s in different forms, basically uh, forming part of different bodies. Uh, but you basically get uh, the FEL ev there every time there is a, uh, an explosive alarm and, and they need actually their, their uh, presence. So give you a couple of examples. I mean, uh, just people basically playing with explosives. I mean, the typical ones that people play is peroxide explosives. Again, very silly thing to do. Uh, every year, uh, there are many people dying uh, and basically losing hands and, and losing limbs because they are trying to manufacture explosives. Sometimes teenagers that they want to, to, to create a, a little explosion uh, and then they don't realize how dangerous these things are. Uh, sometimes, basically, they are not teenagers. They are basically people with bad intentions. And then, obviously, they want to actually create damage, and more serious damage. So in this case, basically, there was these people that it, during a raid uh, in, in, uh, in a property, basically, they found some small crystals. And they found, basically, that the crystals were in the respirator. They basically found the crystals uh, everywhere. And then when they, they analyzed the crystals, basically, they realized that they were in, in front of basically HMTD, basically uh, hexamethylene triperoxide diamine. Uh, and then uh, obviously it was everywhere because uh, they basically go everywhere. Uh, and then you can see the jacket, shirt, belt, watch, basically everywhere. Uh, and then they found uh, small uh, initiators uh, and they were basically uh, trying to connect. So actually they were trying to uh, prepare a bomb. So actually, the guy was, was jailed and then sentenced uh, for two years. So another example, and sadly, very, is basically very, very well known, is the 7-7 uh, bombings. Uh, so actually, uh, they were basically the Islamic uh, attack on London, uh, and they killed basically 52 people. Uh, the FEL attended the scene, uh, and then they recovered uh, some unexploded uh, artifacts. Uh, so actually, that was a very, very lucky uh, finding because when you find something that hasn't exploded and you have uh, everything like detonators, you have uh, the, the explosive, you can actually use it to frame people later and actually to take them to, uh, uh, to court because then you're going to tell them, look, we know it's you because we basically done the forensic analysis and the fingerprint of your explosive actually match the fingerprints or, or residues we found in your clothing or any any items that belongs to you. So actually, the important thing is they can be used for intelligence. So after the attack, five days later, basically, uh, the police raided a property in Leeds. Uh, Leeds and London are not far, basically are not close, sorry. They are actually far away. Uh, and then basically, they were uh, the place where they, they, they suspected the bombs hadn't been manufactured. And they, they actually found evidence, uh, buckets containing uh, some substances, uh, basically HMTD. Uh, so, and actually they were basically playing with uh, pepper and hydrogen peroxide explosives. Again, they were trying to implement easy to make explosives. Again, not uh, very uh, basically, yeah, safe to play. But then again, and just to give you an example, the Barcelona attack, uh, they were basically an explosion. Uh, they basically killed many people. But then when the police was trying to raid the property where the terrorists were, uh, they basically, uh, they actually, they blew themselves. And the police actually at that point actually had evidence that another previous explosion uh, had been caused by TATP and, and it, because they simply didn't actually manufacture that safely. And as I said, when you are trying to manufacture these things uh, in a, in a way that is actually homemade, uh, you're going to have loads of impurities and then that's going to create massive problems and probably kill yourself. So again, it's the typical thing that you do not try to do this at home. You do not try to do it unless you're working for the specialist people or you need to do it for a specific purpose in a lab uh, under supervision. So so basically, again, it's, that's what we did. I mean, we, we fabricated explosives. Uh, we had basically 
uh, one of our specialists, Peter Perini, uh, he works for a company called Extreme Performance. And then they basically have access to military grade uh, detonators. Basically, we had very pure substances. We got basically chemicals from the lab. We produce a very, very effective explosive. And then we detonated it. You saw that explosion. And what is what we did? But we recalled it, the, the fragments. And then when we recovered the fragments, we were analyzing for residues. Unfortunately, basically, that would have been great for a post-blast uh, type of marker. But uh, what we did as well was uh, the tagging. And that's going to be, uh, that's the question there, is schemometry an alternative to tagging? I mean, schemometry is basically used in multivariate analysis. It's actually using lots of variables to actually identify uh, a fingerprint. Of, of any substance. So we did, we tried to actually use a pre-plus tagant, but then we were looking for the composition of the fuel that they were or we were using to produce the, the, the bomb. So actually what we did is we went, we fabricated different explosives with different uh, properties. So we went through the different petrol stations around the city, and then we actually got different small amounts of different uh, petrol samples and diesel samples and uh, we actually created the bombs but then we did what you would do if you recover an unexploded explosive we actually got extracting the 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 fuel in this case the petrol sample we follow, I mean, the paper basically explains everything. I'm not going to explain everything. But yeah, we extracted it. We analyzed it using FDIR and gas chromatography mass spectrometry. We selected a number of markers. And then based on that, we did our chemometric analysis. And we could actually separate the, the different petrol stations, Shell, SO, PP. So actually, why is this important? Well, imagine you get the explosive. It hasn't exploded. Usually terrorists don't, don't, they prepare the bomb, they try to use it as fast as they can because it's not safe to keep. Um, so actually, if you know that the bomb has been pre prepared with BP, that petrol, you go to all the BPs that you have in a, in a certain perimeter, and then you go to the owner, say, can I have your CCTV camera uh, recordings in the last week? And then you can see who's been buying uh, cans, individual cans, because that's odd. I mean, if you're putting petrol in your car, yeah. But if you actually go and buy a can, uh, like in a jerry can, that usually, yeah, people say, oh, yeah, I ran out of petrol. Like, I need to fill up the tank in my car. Yes, but maybe not. Um, and that's where intelligence can be very important, because then you can actually look at the picture of the person running through face recognition, again, using chemometry. Uh, basically neural networks, and then you can identify those people, whether they are tourists or not. Um, so the other thing we've done very recently, and this is actually, you can see it's 5th of August, 2022, basically three days ago, we got a paper accepted. And that's actually uh, the effect of metal catalysis in the electrochemical oxidation of petrol. So actually, uh, yeah, identification of uh, pre-blast samples, uh, it's very important, but then you need a GCMS and you need an FDIR. Some of the FDIR are supportable, but if you want a machine that can actually do the job very fast and very quick in, a, in the spot, uh, electrochemistry is brilliant for that. Why? Because you can have a small potential stud, you can actually run a portable system, you can do the analysis basically in a little van uh, in the crime scene or just outside the 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 place where you actually got the explosive and then you can run your analysis and then as you can say you can actually use electrochemistry to identify shell gulf esso tesco sainsbury's pp different brands of of, of different uh, fuels used to produce explosives in this case it's a little bit trickier because we had to play with a very uh, special uh, electrodes platinum it's an electrocatalytic uh, electrode. And then we were working with adding uh, some metals to the mixture. Uh, and then, for example, iron. Uh, I'm producing a second, basically, a combination of electrochemical oxidation that has been uh, aided by metal catalysis. But even doing that, basically, we got uh, yeah, a signal that was quite uh, unique for the brand, and then we using chemometrics, again, we could separate the different brands. So, so 
our basically Dr. Prell, basically uh, she got her PhD, so she graduated with honors. Uh, we are basically still publishing papers from her, her PhD. So actually, and then you have a picture of her basically in her military uniform. Um, so yes, she came back to Bangkok. We keep in contact, and then she basically we keep working together. So, so conclusions of my talk. Uh, we need to add tagans uh, to be able to trace explosive before or after the blast. Uh, we basically can uh, use uh, tagans uh, in civilian applications because some people could actually steal those explosives and then you need to know where, but then also in military applications, you're going to actually have uh, tagans added. Uh, so, but then some of the tagans are, are, are secret uh, and then you don't know what they are, what compounds you have there that actually only the military knows. Uh, some many substances can be used uh, as tagants, as you could see in the presentation. Uh, but yeah, there are basically uh, effective detection methods. That's where we can add chemiometric. Uh, so actually, chemiometric analysis could be like an artificial mathematical tagant that you can actually use uh, knowing the composition of your explosive. Uh, but there are still basically more uh, research done in this area. So we can identify explosives uh, to prevent anybody from uh, misusing them. So, muito obrigado. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'm here to actually answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Sherlan. You're muted. You're muted. I'm having problems with my microphone and camera. But, uh, well, thank you. Thank you, Professor Jose, uh, for your presentation. Uh, your experience in forensics is uh, is amazing to me. Uh, and actually, you're talking about this, this um, kind of um, Object, object, and um, we have okay. here some, some, uh, we have here some questions from you know, our audience. Um, I'm gonna remove your presentation now so we can okay. talk, we can see you and me. Yeah. We have some questions, uh, about your doubts and commentaries about comments about your, your presentation. I'm gonna show some, some, some of them. Uh, Sunny ask it if there is there any special. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> you basically you shouldn't be working. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I jumped in. No problem. Go on. Yeah, Please. special training. Basically, uh, even if you are a graduate student, you shouldn't be working with explosives. That is the main thing. That's the main. Th you should only be working with explosives if you're working with people who have been authorized by the military or the police to actually work with explosives. Uh, because, I mean, uh, you see, I'm allowed to work with uh, up to 100 grams of explosives, according to British law, uh, but that depends on the country. I, I don't know the legislation in Brazil. Uh, but uh, if you actually, some countries are very strict, even having one gram or two grams of explosives could be enough to actually get you in jail. Uh, a first aid course, basically, if you chop your finger, basically, it's not going to be of much use. Or if you kill yourself, basically, nobody's going to resuscitate with a first aid course. So the best thing to do is not to play with explosives. Uh, if you want to play with explosives, join a unit that actually works with explosives. Uh, join the military or, or, or work with uh, police forces to actually do that job. But then I wouldn't actually... Uh, you don't get a special training. Basically, special training is when you actually join... Uh, the the forensic labs, I'm afraid. So, in in, in the sense, how um, some someone like me, for example, uh, could begin to make research or to do research on forensics uh, with uh, some okay. restricted materials, like or See, or, or res, um, require some special training to do this. I mean, you can do research in explosives very easily. I mean, because you can buy explosives uh, yeah. in a very safe way. So you know that basically when we're talking about uh, analytical explosives or analytical standards for explosives, 
Sometimes you have enough, you have a thousand PPMs. Uh, and then for example, Cerulean, uh, they sell uh, a small ampules of one milliliter in acetonide trial, uh, and you have a thousand PPMs of uh, HMX, uh, uh, RDX. So that is the way you could actually do safe research uh, uh, with explosives. Uh, Again, I would refer to the Brazilian law before you start actually working manufacturing explosives. So for example, when we manufactured the ATP or we manufactured uh, um, AMFO, I knew the British law. I know that for research and analysis, I'm allowed to actually uh, produce 100 grams. Uh, but then you see, to get detonators or the detonators you saw in the screen, uh, we needed military grade and we are not allowed to use military grade, but Peter, He's trained uh, because he's in a company that actually sell these things. And the government is actually guaranteed that he's actually uh, safe to work with. So, so again, I would talk to the police. If you want to do a small uh, research uh, with uh, analytical standards, you could do. I mean, that is actually- But, but it would not be rather uh, far from the reality to perform such a kind of um, no, I mean, research. So if you basically get an uh, analytical standard, 1,000 ppm, and you're looking for a method to detect traces of explosives in in in, in a matrix, oh, okay. that's actually, you could do it. Or for okay. example, if you look at electrochemical detection of explosives with uh, 30 ppm, you see when we did the paper, we produced a paper, a molecular imprinted polymer, a very selective and sensitive uh, uh, sensor for TATP we're basically able to detect TATP at 20 parts per billion. So that was actually competing with the GCMS and the LCMS. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and you see, we never, I mean, we manufactured TATP because we wanted to actually follow the whole thing, but we manufactured one gram because we weren't basically very, we didn't want to risk it. Uh, you see, to actually produce the calibration curves, we were using standard uh, commercial uh, Standard, so actually, yes, is is you can do that, yeah, yeah. I can see the good listening. We have more questions. Uh, for more, we have one for from Professor Halston, which is in, in UK, in Bristol, right now for his PhD, uh, post uh, okay. postdoc stay. Uh, hello, Professor Jose. First, congratulations on the presentation. I'd like to know which tests, characterizations are done to verify the influence of target on explosive performance. So basically, I'm, I'm assuming you're asking, how do we know the targets are going to be safe to add to an explosive? I'm assuming that's yeah. the question. So actually, yeah, uh, yeah I mean, uh, as I said before, before you add a target to an explosive, you have to go through many tests. Uh, you basically, one is time test where you actually leave it there. Uh, you actually uh, basically change the different conditions where the, ex the, the explosive could be stored or it could be transported just to make sure that the tag and didn't actually uh, attack or basically uh, oxidize or, or influence chemically that explosive. I mean, there are many, many different uh, methodologies you could actually follow. Uh, I mean, there are some, some uh, standard procedures, basically, I'm not familiar with every of them. Uh, stability tests are one of the typical ones. Uh, but yeah, I wouldn't be able to tell you like a long list of... of... Sorry. <laughs> There's another question from Frau Fausto. Uh, what uh, what characteristics, characteristics make a good target? So if you go to my presentation, I can't yeah, remember yeah, the, yeah. The, then you have the two different tagants and then what are the characteristics you need to have for each of the tagants. So you will see that they need to be recoverable. For those actually post blast, they need to be recoverable after the explosion. They need to be able to be tracked to basically identify the serial number. For those actually pre blast, they need to be stable. They don't need to actually influence uh, the explosive. So they make, make them sensitive. Uh, yeah, so if you have access, I mean, you can, it, I've, I've been told this is recorded, so you can actually rewind. Yeah, no, it. yes, it's recorded, going to be hosted on our um, oh. I hope page. I didn't say many silly things. So. <laughs> uh, uh, there is another question from Sunny. Uh, there are measures to reduce the illegal use of explosives. Oh, that's a that very good explosive question. Explosive industry should fall. Yes, so 
to be honest, uh, the measures is basically for the manufacturers to actually, or the users to actually keep them safe. So actually when you are storing uh, explosives, you shouldn't basically make it obvious. You should have uh, uh, basically a very secure access to those facilities. Uh, because again, mining operators basically have the quarry. The quarry basically contains a, a, it's usually like a, a secure area where you have your explosive. Uh, that should be only restricted access to certain people. Uh, and, and the more safety you implement in the access to explosives, then the less chances robbers or basically all or terrorists are going to have to actually uh, steal your explosives. I mean, and then more important than the explosive as well is the detonator. I mean, because sometimes manufacturing alpha is fairly simple, but getting a detonator that's powerful enough to actually detonate alpha, yeah, that's not that that accessible. So you see, TATP is very easy to manufacture. You can actually detonate TATP with a, a small uh, fire, fire um, um, oh, my brain, sorry, it's late. <laughs> but yeah, like uh, fireworks, sorry. Uh, but yeah, well, any intense source of heat or electricity. But yeah, again, that would be, that makes them so unstable. So that's why, again, the best, come back to what I was saying, is the best way to do it is try to avoid that. And again, <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good advice. <laughs> oh, you're laughing. Shalom, when I did my chemistry degree, if we were in the third year or second year in organic chemistry, my lectures basically refused to give us the gunpowder uh, recipe because weeks before someone basically blew their hands in Madrid in the school what? of chemistry. Really? Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, it's people do stupid things. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, move on. Um, moving on. Uh, how much does the detectability of vapor targets, such as GNB, change with so, time? So. That's a good because obviously you're going to add uh, the concentration. We're talking about 0.1%. Uh, so with time, basically, that vapor is going to go. So the longer the time, the least detectable uh, the tagging is going to be. So and that's what I was saying. Some people basically get the explosives that they don't use it in 20 years uh, or 15 years. I mean, there are people probably still storing uh, explosives from the former USSR. Uh, where basically they were so open access to actually get everything you wanted. Uh, and then they basically, they, they, explosives are not going to go off. Uh, they are not going to, I mean, if they are securely stored and then preserved well, they can basically be usable uh, hundreds of years afterwards. I mean, you have bombs from the First World War that actually explode and grenades. I mean, it's, it's, if they actually contain, they are dangerous for, for decades. Yeah, so actually, under the years. Yeah, I mean, that, that's why, in a sense, uh, but yeah, the tagging is not going to be there for that long because the tagging by nature is going to evaporate to, to favor mm -hmm. the detection of the explosives. So eventually, you're going to have less and less and less concentration, so it's going to be more difficult to detect. Okay, uh, we have some comments on, on your presentation. Thank you, Marilia, for your question. We have a comment, well, comment from Sandy. Thank you for excellent talk, Professor Jose. Uh, one comment for Karen, Karen Weber, congrats on a very nice presentation, I can say. Um, and a final question also from Marilia. May I ask you to talk a bit about the sampling? Do you expect it for the proportional concentration of different analytes to change with distance? Or are they more or less homogeneous? Ah, I mean, Matthews. Yes. Uh, Matthews he, via Marilia. Yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Especially, you have a, 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 a courier <laughs> to ask for a yeah. question. But yeah, but yeah, I'm assuming you're asking that because you saw the, the test plates that we had in our yes. explosions. So yes, we, that changes with, uh, I mean, when we did it, we in conditions uh, uh, where the blast, basically even where the charge was, if you basically manufacture charge and then for some reason it's not homogeneous and then explodes, in a certain direction, you're going to have that some plates are going to be more contaminated and the other plates are not going to be that contaminated. Uh, so basically the concentration, it could be actually different depending on the weather conditions, uh, depending on the, on the 
uh, wind direction, depending on how well you manufacture your explosive to be in a, in, a, in a spherical blast rather than in a directed blast towards one of the, the plates. So in our case, our, we did it actually well. So we were basically good bombers. Uh, and then we did a very good bomb, and then it went basically everywhere. Mm -hmm. And and actually, so our 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 system was actually quite well symmetrical. But then obviously we had Peter. Peter's an specialist in bomb manufacturing and an explosive. So actually, he could tell us. I mean, because we don't study those things. I mean, he told us how to do it. So okay, okay. Uh, we'd like to to end. I'll, I'll talk, I'll chat about this um, incredible um, and amazing subject is explosives and explosive targets with Professor Jose Gonzalez Rodriguez. I'd like okay. to thank you again for your participation in our first seminar of the semester in, in this event uh, uh, celebrating the University of the Program. Thank you, Dr. Jose. Thank you for your brilliant presentation. And we hope you meet you again. Oh, um, <laughs> another, another opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Jose. Thank you. E eu gostaria de agradecer a todos que estão presentes aqui virtualmente e presencialmente aí no auditório né, da, da nossa universidade. E dizer que nós estamos encerrando por aqui. Tá, pessoal? Uh, até mais e um grande abraço. Bye bye. Obrigado, José, e um Obrigado. grande abraço. Tchau, tchau. Tchau.